All right. How you doing? Uh, Rob Siemens? Yes, that's right. How are you? Excellent, man. All right. Well, I'm looking forward uh, to your presentation. Anything AI, uh, I'm all over it, and I am just a sponge for it, and I'm here for it. So uh, you can go ahead, uh, let us know uh, about your background, and then you can go into your presentation. All right. Sounds good. Um, thanks for the introduction. Yes. Uh, let me just start off by saying, I, boy, I really enjoyed that last talk by Christian. Um, yes. Uh, very thought provoking. Yes. So thank you very much for inviting me to um, to attend Beyond the Hype. Um, my name is Rob Siemens. I'm a professor at the New York University Stern School of Business. It's a business school here in New York City uh, in the U.S. Um, a lot of my research is at the intersection of technology, strategy and innovation. Um, and I've spent a lot of time over the past two to three years um, with my research sort of specifically diving into AI, robots and other types of emerging technologies and trying to figure out conditions under which uh, these technologies work well in businesses and, and, and when they don't. And so that, that's gonna be part of what I talk about today. Okay, and I'll ask you some questions at the end of your presentation there, because I've, I've looked you up and I love what you're talking about and certainly what you're doing and uh, really looking forward to what you're gonna be talking about today. Great, thank you. Thank you, I look forward to the questions. Okay, and can, can you all see my slides? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, so um, as I said a moment ago, so my name is Rob Siemens. I'm a professor at New York University's Stern School of Business. And the topic of my talk is AI, useless without complementary investments. Okay. Um, now, if you will, so that's the title of my talk, but if you will, that's sort of, um, that, that's sort of the main point that I'm going to be driving towards. Okay. And so I'm going to, I'm going to make an argument. Uh, over the course of the next 12 minutes or so uh, that will end with this, you know, hopefully by the end of that, you'll be somewhat convinced that this is true, that in order to take advantage of AI, you as, as a manager at a firm also need to make complementary investments. Okay, and so I'll, I'll describe what I mean, but uh, first let's lay out a few facts. Okay, um, so fact number one, or, or two facts, right? So we've had rapid commercialization of AI and robots, okay? Th these are two facts, okay? So we're starting from facts and we'll sort of build to the argument. Let me, let me provide a little evidence in favor of each. Um, if you direct your attention to the panel on the left, this is total AI funding by year. So let me, let me describe exactly what that is. This is US venture capital firms investments in AI startups, okay, over time. And you can see that it's pretty flat until about 2010 or so. Uh, and then starting in 2010, there's a dramatic increase. Uh, I, I can take the data through 2016. I haven't updated this recently. If I were, you'd see this, you know, this is like a hockey stick, be spiking up uh, way more than that. So, so why is this important? Well, these venture capitalists, they have a lot of high powered incentives uh, to get, to, you know, to make sure that their investments work out, right? To make sure that the, the investments do well. And so what this data is telling me is that venture capitalists believe that there's a lot of this technology, a lot of this AI technology that has important commercial applications. Okay, so that, that's what we learn from uh, the panel on the left. Turning your attention to the panel on the right, this is looking at uh, worldwide shipments of robots, or if you will, robot sales in terms of the units, not the dollar value. So units of robots sold. It hovers around 100,000, this is across the world now, uh, around 100,000 up until about 2010. And then starting in 2011 is where you start to see, again, this sort of dramatic spike up. Maybe not quite as dramatic as what you see when it comes to venture capital funding for AI, but nevertheless, a fairly dramatic increase where over the course of um, the next five years, you basically have a, have a tripling of the amount of robots that are being sold around the world, okay? Now we're gonna be ultimately talking about AI, but I will be talking a little bit about robots because uh, there are things that you can see with robots, right? It's sort of, if you will, a physical manifestation of some of the things that people talk about when they talk about um, the economic effects of AI. And so I think it's useful to talk about robots while recognizing that robots are gonna be a little bit different from AI. But some of the ways in which, um, you know, there, there are gonna be some ways in which they are not different. And, and we'll get to that, okay? So rapid commercialization of AI and robots, okay? And so what are people saying about this as, as these new technologies are entering firms? Um, unfortunately, a lot of mixed results. Okay, there's, I, I, I could point to many, many articles here, but here, here's just a few. From Wired, companies are rushing to use AI, but few see a payoff. From Forbes, 
65% of companies have not seen business gains from their AI investments. From The Economist, businesses are finding AI hard to adopt. Okay, so again, let me go back a slide. Dramatic increase in commercialization of these technologies and yet um, mixed results. Now, as a, as a student of the economic history of technologies, um, I'm not surprised by this. I am not surprised that there are mixed results and, and let me tell you why. Two points here, point number one, and we'll dive into some detail on each of these points, but point number one, prior episodes of automation, right? Prior, prior periods of time when people have invested in these general purpose technologies like AI and robots, but further back in history, that would be things like steam and electricity. Prior episodes of automation have led to growth, right? They've led to performance gains. That's point number one. Point number two, though, is that this growth, it always takes time, right? That performance growth that we're looking to get, it always takes time. And the reason for that is because firms also have to make investments in complementary assets and firms don't know what these are ahead of time. OK, so let me just describe those two points in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to draw from some uh, from some literature here, some e the economic history literature. OK, so point number one, prior episodes of automation have led to growth. So we can look at steam engines in the 19th century uh, uh, UK, okay? Uh, steam engines led to productivity growth over time and, and, and on net, right? So firms that invested in steam uh, saw performance gains. We saw exactly the same thing in the US um, and other places, but the, the literature here that I'm citing is specific to the US. Uh, US firms that switched from steam to, electri to electricity, okay? So the electrification of manufacturing in the US led to performance gains, okay? We also know that. Um, th this last one's maybe a little bit more controversial, but early IT also led to performance gains, led to productivity growth um, at the firms uh, th that adopted uh, these technologies. Okay, so we do know that these technologies, right? We know from history that these technologies lead to performance gains. That's point one. Point two, though, again, this growth takes time because firms have to make necessary investments in what I'm going to call complementary assets. So this could be addition. This could be additional. Uh, physical capital could be additional human capital, right? The firms have to make these additional investments and they don't necessarily know what these are ahead of time. So Paul David is an economic historian at uh, Stanford University, and he spent a lot of time studying what happened to uh, manufacturing plants in the U.S. that were switching from uh, steam to electricity. And he observed that it, that it would take you know up to five years in some cases before firms could fully make this switch. And the reason for this is, is quite simple. You can't, for, from your production process, you can't just unplug the steam power and then plug in the electricity power. There are things that electricity can do that steam can't do. And there are things that ele ele sorry, electricity can't do that steam could do. And so the firms had to reconfigure their production lines. And they didn't necessarily know how to do that ex ante. So it took them some time, some, some experimentation uh, for them to sort of make these changes to their production line before they then saw this performance boost. OK, so again, the, the way I, I like to think about this here is that these new technologies um, are not, quote unquote, plug and play. Right? You can't just unplug one and plug in another. Uh, there, there's a lot of other complementary investments that you have to make. OK, so what uh, so what I want to do is walk you through this just so you can visualize this. And I'm going to talk about robots for right now. Don't, don't worry, we will get to AI. I know I know everybody's excited about AI. We will get to AI, but let, let's sort of let's try to put a little bit more meat on the bones of what I just said a moment ago. And the way that we're going to do this um, is I'm going to give you a little vignette, if you will, a little case study um, from a firm, from, from one of the many firms that I have visited in the, visited here in the U.S. that is switching over to a new type of technology. OK, so this vignette is from a company called Soundwitch, which is outside of Cleveland, Ohio. This is in the industrial Midwest of the U.S. Uh, Soundwitch is part of the U.S. automobile supply chain. Uh, they, they're not an auto manufacturer, they, they're a supplier to an auto manufacturer. And in particular, what they supply are metal, uh, basically pieces of metal that have been stamped and cut into specific ways. Th th this could be really big stamping jobs that they do, maybe for a door frame or something like that, or it could be for a small part that sits somewhere inside of the car. Okay, But they do what's called metal stamping. Um, so let's take a look at these two pictures down here. So the picture on the left shows you a production line and two robots that this company has purchased. This company is much bigger than these two production lines, but this just gives you a little sense of things. Now notice that um, there's not just these uh, robotic arms here, but there's also other equipment that's attached to the robotic arm. 
And in particular, if you could direct your attention to this uh, appendage, which is at the end of the robotic arm, this is a very specific piece that was made precisely for this company so that that appendage could grip this little piece of metal, this little silvery thing that you see right here, um, so, so that it could grip it and present it to the stamper, which is this machine right here. And th this, by the way, is a relatively small stamper. It's about the size of maybe an espresso machine or something like that. Stampers could be quite big. They could be the size of a school bus, right? And they're sort of stamping uh, door frames and things like that. Okay, if you look over here on the right, this is, and I apologize, I, I, am, I am not a professional photographer, okay? I am a professional academic, not a professional photographer. So uh, and these are pictures I took myself. They're not the best, I, I, I realize that, but uh, I am able to show you some of the things that I want to show you with these pictures. So here on the right, sort of the left edge of the right, you again see that little piece that's being presented, right, by the end of the robotic arm to the stamper. And notice all the other equipment here. You've got these blue lights here. You've got this video uh, capturing device here. You have some sensors here. All of this stuff is connected via wires that run behind the machines. Now let's come back over to the, to the left-hand side. Uh, all those wires are then connected to several laptops and, and computers that are set up over here that this individual is monitoring. Okay, so let's step back for a little bit. So, so what's going on here? So this firm wanted to automate a little bit. They wanted to automate by investing in robots, but they couldn't just purchase the robotic arm um, and then start using it. They had to make a whole bunch of other complementary investments. In this case, additional physical capital, uh, additional, if you will, soft capital, right? Sort of investing in uh, the digitization of some of the things that's happening. Uh, some actual software that's used now to run uh, this bespoke uh, uh, computer system that they set up, and also human capital in the form of this individual. He did not work at the company ahead of time, right? That He was someone new that they hired because he had expertise around how to operate the software and also the machinery, okay? So again, not plug and play. This firm had to make a lot of other complementary investments. Okay, so that's robots. Let's now move, we're, move, we're slowly moving to AI. We're, we're gonna talk about predictive analytics. I think most would argue this is not quite AI, but we're, it, it's sort of close to what AI does. Um, this is from some really recent work by Eric Brynholfsson. He's a, um, an economist at Stanford University and his co-author, Christina McElhern, an economist at the University of Toronto. So they have some fantastic data. This, this by the way, is hot off the press. This is some fantastic data collected by the U.S. Census Bureau's division that does, that does data collection and analysis on what's happening with firms, okay? So they have collected data, th th these authors have collected data working with the Census Bureau on firms that have invested in predictive analytics. And what we're looking at here on the y-axis is the performance boost that these firms get when they invest in this predictive analytics. Okay, now here, th so this is very interesting. Let's first look at this first bar here. So firms that invested in predictive analytics, that's the PA, and also invested enough in uh, complementary IT, they see this performance boost. Now compare that over here to this to, to firms that also invested in pre predictive analytics, but without also investing in enough IT, they saw virtually no performance boost, right? So to get that performance boost, it's not enough to invest in the predictive analytics. You also have to invest in those complementary assets. We can see that also with human capital, okay? So this right here, these are the firms that invested in predictive analytics and also hired more highly educated workers. They see a performance boost. The ones that invest in the predictive analytics but don't change their the structure of their workforce, they don't see that performance boost, okay? Okay, so just to summarize, so automating technologies can lead to performance. Uh, performance increases, they can lead to growth, they can lead to productivity growth. But to get this growth, firms need to make additional complementary investments in other IT and human capital. We see evidence of this historically, right? We saw evidence of this with robots as well, right? I walked you through that, that story there. We see evidence of this with predictive analytics. The same is gonna be true of AI. Firms can't just invest in AI. They will get no performance boost from that AI. They also have to make co-investments, right? Complementary investments in human capital, uh, perhaps physical capital, for, for sure other types of capital such as IT, storage and, and, and things like that. And so that sort of summarizes my argument. And we come back to this main point that I'm trying to make here is that investing in AI, you know, it, it's great that firms want to invest in AI, but those investments will be useless without also making complementary investments. Okay. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop my talk and we can throw things open for, uh, for some questions. All right.
Uh, hey, I, 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 I love what you're talking about. And I, and I like the, um, the terminology. Um, uh, you said that, you know, it's one thing to, to put, you know, some, some stuff together, you know, together, you can, you can, you can embrace this, this technology, but you also need those complementary um, assets, you know, those, the, the, particularly the human capital. And um, that brings me to just like sort of this, this question that I, I have had for, for some time. I know that we, you can't certainly get away from um, a post, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, and 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 certainly every day on the news we see uh, a number of stories about how how AI and robotics are just you know revolutionizing things and and impacting um, um, uh, industries. But I just kind of wonder what your question, what your answer to the question would be. Uh, again, you kind of answered it, but I mean, if somebody asks you, what is the value of a uh, human? I don't know what. It's almost like you know what what is the value of human work in a world of AI and robotics? Yep. Um, there will always be huge demand for humans. Got it. Uh, imagine what imagine whatever future world you want for robots, for AI, for other types of emerging or advanced technologies. There will still be a role for humans. Okay. Um, there, and there, there's there are many ways that we can sort of approach this and try to understand this. But let me. As a uh, researcher, I always like to sort of look at the data first, and so let, let me start with that, and then we and then we can sort of expand it from there. Got it. Now it's really too uh, it's it's too early really to sort of see and assess what's going on with AI. So we can come to that, but let, so let's talk about robots first, right? I, I don't know why, but I just love talking about robots. I, I, I hope that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, it, it might be because maybe my name sounds a little bit like robot, you know, Robert <laughs> Robot. I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, so even though robots have been around longer, um, it's it, it just so happens to be the case that there really is, it's really just the last couple of years that enough data has accumulated that people can do very careful empirical studies of what's happening in firms that are adopting robots. Right. All of the, all of the studies that I've seen, including some of the work that I'm doing, that's looking at what happens to labor in firms that are adopting robots mm -hmm. sees an increase in employment. Right. Right. I, so I want to say that again. Every so every paper that's looked at this, and it's there may be six so far, okay. uh, in, in different contexts, different countries, observe that when or find that when firms are adopting robots, those mm -hmm. firms see an increase in employment. Okay. So th th this is a story that, that that perhaps folks aren't as familiar with, right? But but right. but it's it's true. It's a true story, right? That, so okay. so so it looks like these technologies are on net sort of complementary to human work. Um, right. Now, why? So, so, why is it that these firms are seeing an increase in employment? Um, th there are a variety of reasons for this. So, uh, one of the big reasons is that now, whatever the product that you're being produced that you're producing, uh, typically it's the case that it can be produced at lower cost. So right. now you can sell more of them, and so now there's more demand for your product, and so you need to hire more workers, to, as well as purchase more robots in order to produce the products to to meet that demand. Okay. Got it. Um, the other thing, though, that, that, that's going on is that the mix of the type of worker is also changing in these firms. So it's not so it's it, it, it's typically not the same uh, type of work that was being done in the past is still being done at the firm. Right. Uh, it's different types of work. So, so think about the example, the sort of anecdote that I gave of this company called Soundwitch. And I showed you that um, that engineer uh, in the picture. He didn't used to work there. He was hired at the same time that they purchased these robots and this other technology, because he had this expertise. And so what, what this suggests is that when firms are adopting these new technologies, they also have to invest in new, either in retraining their existing workers or in hiring workers that have these new skills. Right. So, so there is so there is a future for humans. Right. But it but the humans will need different uh, you know different skills, maybe different training and things like that. And and not to plug my university per se or any of the other you know folks from other universities that are here but but this is really one of the big important roles of universities okay. is to try to get ahead of some of these switches that we're going to see some of these sure. changes mm -hmm. and think about creative ways to offer uh training in uh the, the types of skills that people that people will need in this in this new world now what now we, we can stay there on on education if you will because i know we have like about maybe 10 minutes here but Great. what um, what can 
uh, a university do? Because you're saying that your university is is embracing this, but wh- what are some of the sort of um, you know uh, proven methods or or approaches that you think would would be really good, you know, to you know to to to, to really prepare students, young people, and just yeah, individuals yeah. in the academy for this new economy. Yeah, yeah, a, a couple of things. So um, I think one thing. So 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 there's content, and then there's also delivery. Got it. Is the way I would think about it. Okay. Um, so, so in terms of content, um, you know, I, I think it's, I believe it's the case that a lot of the technical skills are pretty easy to learn. Right. Um, th- th- these are things that uh, people, you know, in terms of uh, programming languages like Python, let's say, or something like that, to the extent right. that a, a language like that will be important in terms of learning how to set up or implement or take advantage of AI. Um, it, it are pretty easy to learn if you have something like a YouTube video, your own laptop, you know, a YouTube video providing some instruction, your own laptop and the software itself, uh, people can train themselves up on that pretty quickly. Right. So I think it'll be the case that universities focus less and less on offering that, or if they do, they give that away for free, right? Because the value add's not there. The value add is in uh, everything that humans can do and that humans need to do well uh, in a world where you can automate a whole lot of very simple stuff. Right. Um, and so I think of that as sort of these, you know, the sort of softer skills. So strategy, right? I, I'm a strategy professor, so strategizing, you know, looking towards the future and thinking about changes on the horizon and how my firm can adapt to it or, or not. Uh, mm-hmm. th- those are skills that it's really important for people to understand. Uh, working together in a team, could be a, a, a virtual team with other individuals. Uh, th- those types of soft skills in terms of interacting well with others. Uh, th- these are things that business schools teach and, and should continue to teach. Right. Um, so so that, that's in terms of content. In, in terms of delivery, you know, one, one of the things that I think we've learned uh, pretty well from the past year, and I say we, meaning uh, me as a professor at NYU Stern, as well as me as a, a, a father with two kids in elementary school that did remote schooling for the entire past year, um, is that there are different ways that people learn, and not everybody learns in the same way. For my kids, it was remote schooling was terrible. It, it, right. it was not a great year for them. Right. Uh, there are other families I've talked to. I, I'm, I'm a class parent for my son's uh, fifth grade class. There are other parents I talked to where this was great. It was sort of a great opportunity for their kid. Uh, the kid did really well and sort of excelled in, in this type of environment. So we have to keep in mind that there, there's sort of different ways to deliver content, different things work for different people. And I think what we'll see is just, just sort of a big opening up of the ways in which universities um, start delivering content uh, to students. Now, um, beyond the university, because I know definitely that in the the United States, it's just roughly, what, 33, 35% of individuals, you know, um, have a college degree. And so you have a lot of individuals who are not uh, a part of the academy, if you will, are not going to college or universities. And, um, you know, I don't know, there, 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 there may be this kind of misunderstanding about AI and robotics, you know? And so uh, as this kind of gets to a question I asked Angel earlier about AI. There's a, there's a um, hashtag on Twitter, hashtag on Twitter that, uh, it's called AI for Good, and mm. it's being used by the United Nations. They have an AI for Good uh, yeah. forum, yeah, every year. So you're familiar with that, right? right. And um, and I think it's, they use this because they're trying their best to maybe tell the truth about maybe some of the you know some of the more darker aspects of you know the uh, these technologies innovations, but also to say, hey, listen, but there are some very noble things being done with it. So. Um, and, and this is kind of gets to my question. So um, ro- with robotics, uh, remember the uh, video came out this year. And so uh, with uh, Boston Dynamics and it had the, the, yeah, yeah. That was awesome, by the way. I, I love, you know, what they're doing with their robots. And so I guess, you know, and, and I see what they're doing. They're trying to maybe make it fun, that kind of thing, and, and move it away from the more science fiction based mm. aspects of robotics and AI. Um, what are your thoughts on 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 just is that something that you like to see people play up more for the general population that's not necessarily you know that may be you know very fearful and is just taking in these you know the, the you know this yeah. more darker <laughs> aspects of robotics. And AI, like man, these are our overlords, and you know, by the end of the decade, man, it's going to be over for humans. That kind of thing, right? Yeah, you're asking. So, so you you asked a bunch of different things. Um, yeah. Um, I think where, where your question ended up is an interesting question that, that I hadn't thought about before. 
So on the one hand, there are a bunch of videos out there, like the Boston Dynamics, you know, the dogs and things like that. So sometimes it's things that look like dogs. Other times it's other sort of, uh, you know, humanoid looking robots Absolutely. that could do things that look pretty cool, you know, sort of doing flips and, right. and, and things like that, or running around, right. opening doors and, and things like that. Right. Um, so, you know, you can imagine, you can imagine one uh, sort of state of the world where uh, we show all the amazing things that AI can do, right? The right. hype, right? We can sort of hype up what AI robots and, and advanced technology can do. Correct. Um, now, now the downside of that is that it, it perhaps creates a lot of fear amongst individuals that these technologies are going to take our are going to take our jobs, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll make humans unnecessary. At the other end of the spectrum, you could imagine um, lots of videos that show how, really, how poorly the, these technologies perform. And, and actually, we have some of that. Some of that makes its way in the news, right? Um, with Christian, you, you were asking about autonomous vehicles, right? So some of this makes its its way in the news, particularly with, with autonomous vehicles, when you hear about accidents and, and people dying, right? Correct. Now, the downside of that, right? If, imagine the world is sort of inundated with stories about how, how poorly this technology works. So the downside of that is that then people don't trust the technology, right? Okay. I, I don't think we want to be at either extreme, right? We, we don't want to overhype what the technology can do, and we don't want to downplay the technology and say it's terrible, right? right? I, I think either of those... Um, are, are, are sort of, uh, you know, clearly uh, worse off than, than, than something in the middle. And I'm not, I'm not totally sure where in the middle it is, but something in the middle that talks about the, the um, you know, the, the positive performance gains that we can get from using AI and the good that can be done for society while highlighting some of the downsides mm -hmm. and talking about ways that we want to try to mitigate these downsides and, right. and, and that, that it's hard, right? I mean, right. but, but, and again, I think this sort of also comes to a point Christian was making, uh, but we as a society, right, it's on us to think about, to think through and, and, and very critically about the ways that we can try to mitigate these downsides. Right. Right. It, it's not something that we want to just leave totally to the government. It's right. not something that we want to leave totally to private firms. Right. This is something that affects all of us. We should all take it seriously and all, all sort of play a role in it. OK. Uh, and I'll ask you one last question here because this is it's maybe like about five questions that I was writing down as you were talking because I, I love what your, your presentation. This is more of a policy uh, question, but I won't get too deep into the weeds here. <laughs> uh, Bill Gates uh, has a um, had this video uh, that has been bouncing around social media for a number of years, and he was talking about uh, taxing robots. The idea we haven't even begun talking about <laughs> but let me let me set it up for you <laughs> you i know you're, you're okay so his argument was and you and you can explain to me your argument but his whole argument was that he felt that because the population is getting older right and um the population is getting older Let's see, I, I can't hear you anymore. I, I can't hear the question anymore, but let me uh, let, let me roll with it. Um, uh, so the question was about uh, Bill Gates and robot taxes. Um, right. So as I was saying, Sean, I, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, and, and so let me let me explain why, and then I'll come to the demographics point that, that you're making. So um, first of all, uh, Bill Gates is a really smart guy. He's smarter than I am. He's a really successful businessman. I'm not even a businessman, so he's infinitely times better at that th than I am, right? And, and I have nothing but a ton of respect for him. You know, growing up, um, uh, it, so he has reddish hair, right? And so, and, and he's sort of a nerdy guy. And growing up, you know, I, I have reddish hair and I'm sort of a nerdy guy. So he was almost like a, a role model for me. My parents would buy these books about Bill Gates and I'd sort of dream myself of one day maybe meeting him or, or somehow aspiring to be like him. So I have a ton of respect for him. Um, but the, but the idea of taxing robots, I think is a terrible idea and, and that's okay. He can be a smart person, a successful person, but still from time to time have terrible ideas. And, and this is one of them. Um, there are a few reasons why. Okay. So reason number one is, um, uh, th th this, this might sound like overly practical or something like that, but, um, in order to tax robots, you would need to define what a robot is and, and, and that's not easy, right? So, uh, so, you know, a, a physical robot like what we saw in that uh, that stamping company I visit. Okay, we could probably maybe define that. 
Right. Um, what about something like robotic process automation? So this is software that sort of um, helps automate fairly routine type of tasks. So maybe we could call that a robot. Um, what about predictive analytics? Like, is that is that robotics or or, or, or not? Right. It, there we would be talking about sort of virtual, you know, a virtual robot. Um, it, so, so definition. The definition is from the outset hard to do. You can imagine crafting legislation around this, and you know who's going to be defining what a robot means? Uh, it's going to be lobbyists and and lawyers that, that are helping define what a robot means. I mean, it, it doesn't. That, that part of it doesn't make any sense to me. So th there's a definitional issue. Uh, second, it, it, there are a bunch of points I can make here, by the way, but I'll just make a few. Uh, second point that I would make is that uh, recall earlier in, in the talk we were talking. I, I was uh, um, telling you about about the fact that. Uh, firms that adopt robots are the firms that see employment growth. And so if we tax them, if we tax firms that are adopting robots, they would probably address, uh, sorry, they would probably adopt less of them. And so we would then get less of that employment growth that we're hoping to get. And so it sort of has this perverse and, um, uh, effect, right? Where the tax actually means that there's less employment growth and, 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 uh, and also of course, less uh, productivity growth. Uh, so so I, think, I think that that's also bad. Um, and, and then um, I think the third reason is you can imagine if the U.S. put in place a tax like this, that large multinationals would just shift some of their manufacturing altogether uh, to other countries that don't have these taxes in place. I see. Now, now, what what would be the so so that in 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 of itself is a problem, but where it's particularly a problem is that smaller firms like mom and pop organizations that are not multinationals, but still do manufacturing, still have robots and things like that, they're not able to do that. And so they are the ones, right? It's small businesses that are the ones that would be most affected by this, not the large businesses, um, right? And, and again, I, I could go on, but but I think it's a really poorly thought out idea that robot taxes are, are somehow um, going to be a panacea. Now, in terms of demographics, so again, the um, so earlier when I was saying firms that adopt robots, you see an increase in employment, right? So part of my point there is that um, robots and humans can be complementary, right? Um, really, one, one great example of where we see this is places like Japan, where the demographic profile uh, is even more extreme than it is here in the U.S. in the sense that there's many more people that are retired relative mm -hmm. to those that are working. In, in the U.S., like we're not so out of balance as, is, as it is in Japan. And so as a result in nursing, this is from a, a research paper, not mine, somebody else's, uh, some folks from Stanford. Um, so, so an area where there's a lot of demand for work is in um, nursing. Okay, so th there are a bunch of nursing homes in Japan, just like in the US. Uh, there are more and more nursing homes as the population ages. The work, you know, the human work that gets done in nursing homes is really hard. You know, it involves lifting people in and out of bed and things like that. And so the the firms there that have done really well are the firms that still you know still hire workers, human workers, but also invest in robots to assist with the lifting up and the moving around of people. And it's still important to have humans there for that sort of human touch. But right. now that really difficult work uh, is now being done by a machine. That, by the way, then makes it even more you know you as a potential worker, you're more prone to want to work at a firm that has this type of equipment that has the, the, these uh, robotic aids as opposed to one uh, that doesn't. And so you actually see uh, that, that those are the firms that are, that are growing the fastest, the, the ones that have invested in robots. Okay. Um, so, so again, uh, big point here is that robots and humans, there are many examples, many ways in which they're very complementary to each other. Well, if you if you wrote something on it, I, I would share uh, that because I know that there's a, a conversation about this um, that, you know, that has bubbled up even in Europe. They tried, I think the European Union um, uh, tried to uh, pass something. Somebody in the European Union tried to, to pass something and it, 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 was, it was defeated. Um, and this is not something we're talking about here, but people are talking about it. Somebody did do a, a, a video about this, sort of trying to refute uh, Bill Gates, but I'm not sure that they touched on the the, the points. What the points that you're making are, are very interesting because you brought up the demographic part, and I think that one of the things he was talking about in the video was he, he was talking about it as like a robot replacing a human, and if right. if the robot replaces a human, you can then right. go ahead and like you know that that tax base. That's what he was right. really sort of getting at. Right. But if, right. you, if you write something on it, I'll share it. So. Uh, great. So, so maybe we'll be in touch on on that. Well, um, 
but, but just real quick on the replacing thing. Um, so again, it's really hard to, to identify when that happens. Okay. Um, so, so, so take that manufacturing setting um, that I was describing in, in Ohio. Right. Um, the, the, no one was replaced there when, when they when they purchased uh, the robot. Uh, it was sort of a new production line that they set up and a new worker that they hired. Right. Um, uh, but w w what if down the road, as, as once they get that up and running, um, then somebody else who's on a different production line, maybe they're, you know, they're going to then uh, also put robots there because uh, it looks like it's working so well on the new production line. So is right. that is that person now replaced? Right. Or not, you know, again, it's a definite, like, so what's a robot? What does it mean to be replaced? What's the time right. frame? Is it right. a year? But then you'll get a bunch of gaming going on where people say, you know, where, where firms keep people on for a year and a day. Okay. Uh, right. I mean, it's just, it's so hard, like in order to get the tax to work well, mm -hmm. uh, you have to define all of these things really well, ex ante. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not confident that, that that can happen. Okay. Well, look, you and I will be in touch. And like I said, I, I would love to see you, you know, either either write something or do like a video. If you did any of that, I would share it because I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea that is going to be at some point, uh, some variation of this, as you know, will be at least considered. And I'd love to yep. have, you know, you know, your, your thoughts on it on, in something compact that I can share in social. That would be awesome. That sounds good. So, so Sean, that, that's a th whereas Bill Gates got the thumbs down. You get the thumbs up. Sound good? <laughs> okay. Sound good? All right. All right. Sounds good, man. Well, thank you. I, I love your presentation. Sean. Loved uh, the question and answer here. And uh, you and I will be in touch for sure.